Welcome everybody to this week's Mindful Social. It's a podcast where we talk about social media and content marketing and taking a more mindful approach to how we do business and how we market. And this week, I'm very excited to have Amy Higgins. Uh, we've known each other for some time and Amy is just hella smart. And I'm really yeah. excited to have her here to talk about content marketing. And uh, Amy, why don't you give us a little background on who you are and what you're up to? Um, so as Janet says, we've known each other for quite some time. I do content marketing. I started my career in social media, then went to community, and then went back to social and finally into content. Um, so I specialize in B2B content marketing and really taking the content and making it a machine. So a lot of reuse and repurpose of content. So how does that work when you're repurposing content? You know, I, I see a lot of people that think sharing the same post title over and over and over and over and over again is repurposing content. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a little more to it than that. Yeah, so I'll give you an example. Um, we did an ebook with Top Rank Marketing uh, when I worked at Zozi, and it was an ebook about customer reviews, how to get reviews, how to respond to negative reviews, um, and how to keep the review chain going. And we made it very broad for our audience. Well, then a week before a conference, we learned about this escape room conference, which is huge for Zozi's industry. So we put everything together really quickly for the escape room and we repurposed that ebook by reskimming it to have escape room images and then redoing some of the facts and figures and the text to talk about escape room. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have to recreate the wheel. We used what we already had and repurposed it for another vertical. So you really so just really made just it more, made more, relevant. more relevant. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Resharing the same title over and over again is just resharing. It's not repurposing. Mm -hmm. um, but taking that content and figuring out where you can use it, how you can use it. Is this an ebook? Can I turn the ebook into an infographic? Can I turn that infographic into a social graphic? Can I use that social graphic for advertisement, either Google banners or, you know, social advertisement if you want to? That's all repurposing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's say that you're creating uh, a piece of content and we'll start with lead gen. Uh, mm -hmm. If lead gen is your goal, how is that different from content that you're really looking for awareness with? So lead gen is later down in the funnel. Um, a lot of people think they can take a blog post that's about the state of the industry or about something and it's too top of the funnel. It's too much awareness and people aren't going to convert. They'll read it. They'll learn about the space, but they're not going to convert. So Legion content is directed to conversion. So you want to look at, are they going to purchase their product? Are they ready to purchase your product? Are they ready to pull the plug, move forward, talk to a salesperson, all of that. If they're not ready, and your content doesn't direct them down that way, it shouldn't be lead gen oriented. The goal should be awareness. Mm. So let's let's, so let's talk let's about that just a little bit more. And, and what? How do you define top of the funnel? And you know, for people that don't know a lot about content marketing, and maybe everything they put out is top of the funnel. Let's let's yeah. talk about how that system works. So top of the funnel is really about getting eyes on your brand. So it's all about awareness. It's getting people to understand what the space is, understand that you know what you're talking about. Um, and it's a lot more engagement and learning and creating a conversation. Mm -hmm. So it has nothing to do about, oh, they read this blog, I'm going to shove them onto sales. It's <laughs> that sales always thinks, oh, this is a great blog, you have tons of hits, why aren't we having leads? Mm. Um, it's more education and creating that community. Yeah, so awareness yeah. is really just to get in the door, right? Exactly. So how do we move people along the funnel from awareness to actually making that sale? And this is a 
crazy question, but how many steps is there to that? Can I have it now? <laughs> so the steps, the steps vary with industry and vary with technology. So if it's something, let's take an iPhone, the new iPhone, everybody's going to be aware of iPhone seven coming out. So mm -hmm. the awareness is already there. So the step from awareness to purchase is very limited, but say you have a new product or a new, um, something new that no one's ever heard about, then the steps are going to be a lot longer. Right. Um, say if it's you're going towards small businesses versus enterprise for a SaaS product. Enterprise, the steps are a lot longer because it's more buy-in. You have to get the end user up to their manager, up to their boss, up to finance and budget and the tech and all, all these other departments. And so, and so the steps get the longer, steps and get longer, longer, the more the more so long. So in general, then, is B2B a longer stream than it is for B2C? Hmm. Now, most of my experience is in B2B, but I would say B2C, yes, is shorter because people usually know what they want and the awareness is already there. Hmm. Right. Would you agree? I would agree. I think most of my experience is in B2C and, you know, it, it is there is already some awareness of the need. And I think the marketing is very different because you're targeting something maybe more specific than you are with B2B. And maybe that's a gross generalization. I don't know. See, I think you're targeting something more specific with B2B than uh, B2C. We um, all think we're more specific then is what we're saying. Yeah. <laughs> well, you look at the competition. Mm -hmm. So competition with, B2B, you know, it could be you've got five major competitors mm -hmm. or you have 10 major competitors. It all kind of depends. Um, some B2B, what you're competing against is really inertia. Mm -hmm. You know, they could do nothing at all or they could buy your product and really help themselves and help you. Yeah. Um, or B2B is more, it's that want versus need. Like, do they need this right now? And yeah. Do they want it right now? It depends on how much they want it. Mm. Mm. Where there's not much want in B2B. Interesting. B2B, yeah. 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 So as we're trying to move people down the funnel, how do we evaluate where people are? Are there listening tools, for example, that we could be using to really more clearly understand where someone is in the market so that we know where to guide them in the funnel? Yeah, so a lot of it comes from, unfortunately, looking at your content after the fact. <laughs> so <laughs> it's hard when you start off to go, here are the steps, here's the content we need to create. Mm -hmm. You kind of have to test and reiterate. So you test a bunch of things to start off with, and then you look back. Okay, this person barred our product, so now we have them in their system. Can we track their IP back? If they haven't cleared their cash for their cookies, I'm sure you hear my cat running around. <laughs> Can we track things back to see where they came from and what they did? Did mm -hmm. they look at a blog and then they did they go to another blog? And then did they not come visit us for a month? And did they come in because we sent them an email? Mm -hmm. After that email, did they go to a product page? After they went to a product page, did they ask to connect or watch a demo? So all of those steps will kind of tell you where they are in the funnel. Mm -hmm. So the more activity, the deeper they are. Usually, I've seen things where we send them an email, and the highest trigger for me is did they share that email? Mm -hmm. Not only did they open it, but did they share the content with other people on their team? That means, you know, think about it. When you share an email, you're like, hey, Amy, look at this. This is really cool. What do you think about it? It's the same way on the business. They're like, sure look at this. What do you think? Maybe we should discover this more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what kind of tools do you use to evaluate that path? So a lot of it is connecting your tools together. So it's connecting your content management platform with your CRM. Um, I've used Kapost in the past. They're really good. You can look at your Google Analytics mm -hmm. with your content, with whatever demand gen program you're using, like Marketo, and then your CRM like Salesforce. 
and look at that all together. So is there one tool? No, but there are many tools that you have to look at together. And then there are tools like Compose, which is a content management platform that will connect all of those for you. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Karata does it as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a lot of us are all looking for that perfect dashboard that's going to pull all that together and process it for us so that we don't have to do the work. Yeah. And those still aren't out there as far as I know. Yeah. Well, it's like social media five years ago. Mm -hmm. I think I used, you know, five to 10 tools a day to look at traction and look at where people are clicking through, how's it working. And now I can use one to two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you think that's gonna evolve with? I do. Um, mm -hmm. I think content management right now and looking at how the marketing funnel is working, there's so many tools and each tool does one thing very, very well. Um, and I think that's gonna involve more so that one tool will connect everything very well. Mm -hmm. But at the but end of the day, we still need to look at it with our own human brains, mm -hmm. figure out, you know, what's working, what are people responding to, what are people reacting to, so that we may be getting some negative reactions. Um, a lot of that goes back to what you said about, you know, just doing some testing and, and floating some things out there and seeing how people are responding. Is that, that pretty much the approach? Yeah, there's a lot of, um, you know, qualitative research that goes into it. Mm -hmm. On the B2B side, I sit down with salespeople. You know, what did they see? <gasps> Marketing and marketer. sales. You sit down with sales? Marketing <laughs> and sales combined, oh no. Um, okay. you know, it's talking to them and going, how did this person come in? Mm -hmm. What are they talking about? What are their concerns? What are their pain points? Because sometimes we don't actually talk about what their pain points are because we don't know until we talk to sales. Mm. Um, and there's other, like I remember at Concur, we discovered with talking with sales that most of our people came in because of referrals. They used our product before, they went to a new company, and then they started pushing at the new company, hey, I use this, we really need it. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no way for us to you know, be a fly on the wall or do spy tech that we can hear all those conversations. Right. So, you know, we talked to sales, learn those conversations. And then we started implementing content management and content campaigns directed to those buyers. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit more because I think a lot of marketers take uh, a less than mindful approach to how they really reach out to customers because they create their marketing content in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And it's very common and you can see it pretty clearly when marketers are talking to themselves. I think the press release is probably the most classic example of that. But there's a lot of ebooks out there too that you know you can't even read through the first paragraph without going, ugh, get it off me. Thank you know, you. and but so the difference between that in part is talking to sales and listening to the market. Um, do you have some tips that you can share with us about how to glean that information before you start marketing to really create something that's gonna, gonna work for lead gen? So I sit back, I don't start any program until I actually look at the space. So <gasps> um, <That's> amazing. <laughs> look at, it's a lot of listening. It's a lot of what are other people doing? Who's successful? I mean, don't reinvent the wheel, look at your competitors. What have they said? What's, what's missing the mark? What's a common theme? And then talk to sales and then also do sales calls with close not one. So this sale did not close, why did it not close? And mm -hmm. this is a hard one, but asking a customer who has said, no, I don't wanna buy your product, to talk to someone in marketing to learn why is very difficult. So you have to talk to salespeople to figure out this person really wanted us, but they couldn't get us or you know, they couldn't get their boss to sign off on it. And then you talk to those people. Mm -hmm. I think those conversations are very difficult, but absolutely crucial. And, and as a, a consumer and end user, 
I'm always thrilled when marketing says, so why'd you cancel that subscription? We want to know more. We actually care about why. Uh, it's such a rarity that it's pretty, pretty mind-blowing when it happens. Yeah. Latote, are you familiar with the company Latote? I'm not. They are a subscription service for clothing, and it's rental clothing. So mm -hmm. um, you pay a flat fee a month. They send you clothing and jewelry so much, and then it's kind of like how Netflix used to be. You wear what you want, and then you send it back. Mm -hmm. And if you keep it, they charge you for it. If you send it back, then they send you another box. Mm -hmm. um, so their subscription service, they won't cancel it unless on a phone. So you actually, you can't hit a button and say cancel. You have to talk to a customer service representative, which is annoying for yeah. me. But the reason they do that is so they gain that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Why is this person leaving? Are we not offering the clothing they want? Are, is our cost too high? Are we not shipping things on time? Like, so they discover the pain points of why people are leaving. Mm-hmm. I'm seeing that a lot in email campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you unsubscribe or, you know, cause I unsubscribe every day, I probably unsubscribe from 20 or 30 email lists that for whatever reasons. And some of them will come back and say, so what are we not doing? You know, why did you unsubscribe? And I'm like, well, cause you, <laughs> you subscribed me without asking in the first place. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I think I that it does also. matter. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about if we're, we're starting with awareness. Mm -hmm. um, we want to build an awareness campaign for a product that really hasn't been seen very much in the B2B space. There's only a few competitors. So you stand out pretty well, but nobody knows you're there. So you don't stand out at all. So how do you start building that awareness? I mean, let's, let's, really talk about how you build that campaign and, and what the process for that is. So everybody can go do it and then we don't. Yeah, I look at a very high level. So mm -hmm. what, what industry are you in? What product are you providing? What need does it solve? And you don't talk about the product at all. You talk about the pain points and the need. Mm -hmm. And then you start educating. And so you become, you know, the, the goals for awareness are going to be website traffic, click through subscribers, do you have return visitors, are you gaining more visitors? And so in order to do that, you have to continue education. So do they understand this field? Do they understand the need? Can you give them tips and tricks to help solve their need without mm -hmm. giving them the product? Mm -hmm. And then the next step is you kind of build on top of that. So here are the tips and tricks, and here's one step more how our product can help. And then they're like, oh, this is kind of interesting. What is this? Hmm, let, me, let me look further. And then you add more on top of that. Oh, here's our product. Mm. Convert. Yeah. 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 And I think it's interesting that, you know, we, we all are very suspicious of mm -hmm. content from any kind of a brand. And I think maybe, I don't know if it's more true in B2B or not, but, you know, you're always getting all of those emails, um, you know, round product. But if you're actually being educated and it's something that you can take to your boss and go, oh, look at the new thing I learned and not necessarily tell them who you learned it from, then mm -hmm. by enabling that customer, you're really kind of getting them to buy in to the next email and the next email and the next email. I want to hear from you. Yeah. Well, it comes down to what your customer's wants are. Mm -hmm. is, is their want, are they a small business and they want to grow their business? So you're giving them tips and tricks on how to grow their business. Is it a marketer at a Fortune 500 company who their only goal at the end of the day is to show their boss they know what they're doing? And so to get a raise or a promotion or do things better at their job to help everybody else. So you start giving them content about how to market how to be better at your job, how to reduce time. And then you kind of feed in, here's how our product helps you reduce the time. Mm -hmm. But not with every touch. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's, I kinda, go ahead. 
I was going to say I relate marketing a lot to dating. Mm. Now, I market all the time. I don't date all the time. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I think about awareness as, you know, when you're a kid in high school, you like this guy, you know, he's on the football team, so you start going to football meets. You're like, oh, maybe I'll bump into him. <laughs> but what you're doing is getting him to see you and recognize you. And you're being somewhere where he is or is known to be. Now, you haven't gotten up the courage yet to go up to him and go, hi, baby. Let's go out. You know, you haven't done that yet. <laughs> but you're being around him. And so that's mm -hmm. where the awareness game is. You want to be where your customers are and talk the talk that they talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, I think that having that softer approach is certainly easier to get people to be stickier. I think, you know, one thing that I see a lot in content marketing that um, turns me off is when I'm getting hit all the time. And if I'm getting hit with sales pitches all the time or that sales pitch comes too early, then I'm gonna go, oh, okay, well, I did learn something, but they're kind of annoying now and I'm gonna leave. Yeah. Um, how does it differ? if you're dealing with a product that has a pretty high price point because that's you know pretty common with b2b that you're looking at a bigger buy so does that change how your strategy works you have to look at the buying cycle of customers so are they buying at the end of the year or the beginning of the year a lot of people's um fiscal year starts like the fine arts it's in san francisco Fiscal year starts in the summer because of where they are, but that's knowing your market. So where to hit them? Like I wouldn't try to sell them something right before Christmas because no one's going to buy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's my end of my year. I'm out of budget. Let me alone. Yeah. Uh, but for the bigger budgets, you have to look at the audience as a whole. So not only the audience you're engaging with, but the audience that they're engaging with on the other side that you don't know about. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll get, like you were saying, email. I get email triggers when I download eBooks and then this is what turns me off. I get downloaded this eBook that's very top of the funnel and then I get, or download the eBook. Then I get an email from a salesperson. Hey, I see you downloaded this eBook, yada, yada, yada. I would love to tell you all about our product. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not interested <laughs> in your product yet. <laughs> I don't know what your product does. I don't want to be on the phone. Um, but that's, that's some of the things to talk about. If I had gotten an email that said, Hey, I see you downloaded this ebook on topic X, Y, and Z, check out these blog posts as well. Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, Oh, that's interesting. And then it keeps me engaged. It keeps me wanting to know about the customer and wanting to know about the product. And then hopefully they send me to a blog that's further down the funnel. And then another ebook that's further down the funnel. And when I download something that's like, when I watch a product video, then that's when they call me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and along that way, they're learning things about what it is you like, you know, which of those eBooks you opened, uh, yeah. what links you clicked in the eBook to gain more information, and then they can gain a lot more about you and, and understand, you know, where you are in the product cycle, um, in the purchase cycle, but also, you know, what you're, what your pain points are. And I think, you know, that's, that's something that we see in really great content marketing. Sometimes I feel like they know more about what it is that I need than I do, that I haven't really gotten to that point yet where I know what it is that I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And um, boy, if somebody can come up and go, Oh, this is right here. This is what you've been looking for. And it really is then, wow, I'm totally going to buy that. A lot of that, um, becomes a complicated campaign. Mm -hmm. So complicated meaning you have to think of it in layers. Um, doing something, a linear movement from a campaign never works, at least in my experience. You mm -hmm. have to think of, okay, they're coming into awareness. They get deeper in the funnel. What, what did they click through? What did they look at? And where can we lead that on the next step? Mm -hmm. So it might be, it might look like peak and valleys, like it's a flat line. And then all of a sudden they go up north and they go back down south and then they're back on the flat line. But you have to think about all those issues and that's where you can get 
you can close the sales cycle. So you can take mm-hmm. something that's six weeks and make it into two weeks just because you're hitting them with exactly what they want to hear. Right. So it's really part of understanding what their decision tree is. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I. Uh, Bethy asks, uh, what is your opinion on native advertising? It depends on who you're using and what your product is. <laughs> so <laughs> That's too easy an answer. I know, but I like, I think native ad advertising works really well. I mm-hmm. think, you know, AdWords work really well and social media advertising works very well, but it all depends on your audience. So Bethy, very broad question. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, uh, Bethy, if you want to narrow that down a little bit about a, on a particular category, we can probably address that a little bit more. Uh, and really, for people who don't know, why don't you, Amy, tell us a little bit about what native advertising actually is? Mm, I'm going to redirect that to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not my specialty, to be honest. So I really, I really feel that you know, native advertising is advertising within the content and within the frame that people are studying. So you know, for example, within a Twitter chat is is a great way to do native advertising, and really, it's a form of organic uh, conversation more than it is advertising, in my opinion. Yeah, that's really yeah. not advertising. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is, but yeah, it is. it's pushing people where they need to be. <laughs> right, right, yeah. and cheaper. <laughs> Very uh, much cheaper. Zoe asks if brand awareness more about content strategy or overall likability, likes, shares, and clicks. So brand awareness is content strategy, but it. I think what you're asking with overall likability, those are more metrics. So. Mm. Likes, shares, clicks, those are all metrics that will tell you how your content is operating. But I'll give you an example. Um, Say your brand awareness is about, say your goal is to get people to buy this travel platform. And you're looking at brand awareness that they are clicking on a photo that's about puppies. So yeah, you've gotten those likes, shares, and clicks high, but do puppies have anything to do with your travel platform? Right. Probably not. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you get likes, shares, clicks on a blog post, that's about how to optimize traveling to Timbuktu, like what to pack for Timbuktu, let's put it that way, mm-hmm. then it is brand awareness and is part of your content strategy. But content strategy is all about hitting your message to your customer at the right time. That's a really challenging thing too, especially with platforms like Facebook and for example, Mm -hmm. because you got to throw in the, the occasional cat video just to get awareness, but also not to get awareness about your brand, but to stay in the stream. Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of tactical things that you have to do that may not really Um, be specific to what you're trying to market. And, you know, I I see a lot of people doing that um, because they know that they need to be in there. Um, We kind of advise against it. But I I really wonder what you think when you see a brand that really doesn't stay on target. Um, You know, how important is that to stay on your brand messaging every single post? I think it's hugely important. But it's um, when you want to get those light, fluffy puppies, think about what are the light, fluffy puppies that are in your brand. Mm. So I'll give you an example. When I was at Concur, which is a travel and expense platform, we did a post, a blog post that was five places you do your expense report that nobody knows about. Like, let's (laughs) talk about the real truth. I took a picture with my pants down in the restroom. (laughs) So it was like my pants down around the floor with my feet. It's, I'm doing my expense report right now. Nobody knows I'm in the restroom stall. Mm -hmm. And that, that gets the likes and the shares and the funnies and has nothing to do really about our platform from the customer's point of view. 
but it does because the only way you can do your expense report in the bathroom is by using Concur's expense mobile app. <laughs> Thank God. Because, you know, <laughs> my expenses. Oh, yeah, it, it, that's good. I, I think making it relevant to something people can actually resonate with. If not, you know, that specific instance, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I do my expense reports on the plane or in my car while I'm waiting for a meeting. There's a lot of things that you can do with that. Yeah. Um, Bethy says native advertising is creating content disguised to be news articles. Um, gosh, I kind of disagree with that. Uh, I think it's creating content that, you know, is maybe pertinent or relevant to something that's going on, but I'm not sure that I'd call news jacking quite the same thing as native advertising. But No, and it depends on the news jacking. So having a having your CEO be a publisher in Huffington Post. Is that native advertising or is that thought leadership? And is thought mm. leadership native advertising? That's a great question. I can't I feel answer. a whole mindful social talk <laughs> on Bethy's topic. Yeah, I think you're right. I yeah. think you're right. Because the, the difference between thought leadership and advertising can be very confused. Yeah. Uh, you know, we Fine see line. it a lot on, on LinkedIn as well. But, you know, I've worked with people who have um, published posts on the Huffington Post with the hope that it would be advertising and it simply wasn't effective. Um, consider where you're marketing as well, for yeah. sure. Well, I mean, people buy from people. Mm -hmm. They don't buy from products. They buy from people. Yeah. So if you get your CEO to post on Huffington Post, or if you do content on courts, which is paid, mm -hmm. which they charge you. Um, so technically it could be an advertising budget. But if people like those articles and like the CEO or like the founder, they are more apt to buy from someone they like, from someone mm -hmm. they don't know who's behind the product. Somebody, somebody they agree with. Yeah. 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 Uh, Bethy also says brands are sponsoring BuzzFeed articles to gain awareness for their brand, such as Swiffer sponsoring an, sponsoring an article about the best ways to clean your floor featuring their product. And that's yeah. certainly a great example of native advertising. Um, does it sell us stuff or is that any different than telling us the same thing on their Facebook page? Well, if they told it on their Facebook page, then you have to like the Swiffer Facebook page to see it. There you go. And then yeah. they get those likes. Yeah. If they tell us on BuzzFeed, which has a broader audience than probably their Facebook page, mm -hmm. then they're creating awareness where they didn't have awareness before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And which, it, uh, go ahead. Which to Bethy's point is the whole reason for advertising. Right. You know? Right. And sponsoring those kind of things is very different to me than, you know, sponsoring a hundred bloggers who clearly don't care about your product, um, you know, to write a post saying how wonderful it is, um, which is a very common tactic. And I, I really think people see through those things mm -hmm. now where they didn't in the past. And, you know, that's not Buzzfeed. It's more much smaller bloggers than that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, even look at influencer marketing. Mm -hmm. you know, influencer marketing three years ago used to be, oh, here's this professional athlete. Let's pay them to wear our shoes. And that's going to be endorsement. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, if you take the shoes, if you find someone in an area that a market that you haven't hit yet, who blogs, who tweets, who Snapchats, and you get them to wear their shoes. That's gonna be a higher conversion rate for the audience that you want than some big superstar, or a lower cost too. Because a big yeah. superstar, you have to pay. Someone lower, you help out mm -hmm. with the trade. Yeah, we do We do a lot of influencer outreach with Tattoo Digital, to be fair, and, and we've often found that even people who are so-called influencers on specific platforms, um, they have big numbers, but maybe they don't actually get any sales resulting from what they post. 
just having a huge following doesn't necessarily mean that anybody's listening to you at all. Yeah. Um, and I think the same is true with celebrities that, you know, that, paying Kim Kardashian a million dollars to post, you know, a picture of your hat on Instagram really, does it have that much effect? I'm not sure. Yeah. What's the resonance? Mm -hmm. You know, are they, they might be tweeting or Instagramming a million times a day, but if people aren't following it and engaging, then it doesn't make any sense. It's just noise. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and uh, Zoe says, is all press good press? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's noise again. Mm -hmm. um, I had a CEO who thought awareness was noise. So let's blog every single day because we're creating more content. Mm -hmm. And that's going to get us more awareness and more awareness equals more leads. His words, not mine. Um, I disagree wholeheartedly. I think if you have the right type of music, not noise, people are going to listen. Mm -hmm. And once they listen, then that's going to be good for your company and good for the awareness. Well, and, and let's... <sighs> What do you want us to be aware of? Do you want us to be aware that you're annoying? Or do you want <laughs> us to be aware that you get what our problem is? And I think, you know, that goes to the whole concept of mindful social. Yeah, I really do care about what your problem is and, and want to, you know, compassionately, I want to solve your problem. And oh, look, I actually have the solution to your problem because I have had it or we experienced it or we understand that it's there and we want to solve that problem. That's a very different looking uh, scenario than I'm going to slap you in the face with a fish once a week until you buy my stuff. <laughs> we get a lot. Yeah. Hmm. That reminds me of my trips in Zanzibar. So I was on the beach in Zanzibar and you would get tribal men who actually I think were just dressed up as the Maasai, who's one of the tribes in Africa. Mm -hmm. And it would start off, it became a game. And I find content marketing the same way. They would start off, hi, young lady, where are you from? Where are you going? Who are you? What, you know? Um, so they would start a conversation. Now the ones that started a conversation, yes, I would talk to, and I started watching the other tourists start talking to. And then, the ones that were bad would come in and go, oh, have you been over here? I have a little booth. Come look at my stuff. And they're like, dude, I'm walking on the beach. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> Let me enjoy my Mai Tai. And I think it's the same thing. Like when you're doing content marketing and trying to get awareness, you get people to know who you are. And if you hit them with the legion too soon, you're going to get the same reaction. Dude, leave me alone. Mm, that's great. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I get that. And I think that that's, you know, it, take a marketer on a trip and see what she's watching. She's watching people market. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make you a marketing addict? I'm not so sure. <laughs> uh, addiction's double. Um, right? Zoe has a question. As marketing professionals, is the overall goal always profit? Mm. So... I would say as a business goal, it's always profit. For marketing, no. Sometimes you're timing your company that you need to spend more money to make money. Other times, and so yeah, profit, but you're in the red. You're spending way more money to get awareness, to get people to know you, to get people interested in you before you're actually selling the product. So profit, of course, is the end goal down the line, but the stage in the game, it might just be awareness, which has nothing to do with profit. I think I'd to add to that, I think marketers actually want to know, you know, not everything that they put out there is for lead gen. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it's really to understand the market better and to hear what they're saying so that they can be more effective. So that may not have the immediate end goal of profit and sales. Ultimately, it probably does. But yeah. I don't think that every action that someone takes in marketing is 
geared towards that almighty dollar. Um, Cause it's just too much of a driving force. You wouldn't be able to think you wouldn't be able to work. Yeah. It, in a perfect world as a marketer, if I could have everybody take the exact steps that I want them to take, I would do way less work. You know, mm. like I would have three pieces of content because I knew they go step one, step two, step three. Woo, I win. <laughs> that never happens. So, yeah. you, you know, you might have 10 steps and they might go step one, step five, back to step three, and then to step seven, back to step six, and then nine and 10. But learning their map, and learning where they're going, to your point, is very interesting because that then helps us to analyze our next campaign and how we can do better. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and it, it's all data if we actually look at the data, which some of us don't as much as we should. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on that note, uh, you know, I I always enjoy talking to you, and I always learn a lot. Uh, can you tell people how they can find you and how they can connect with you on social? Sure. So all of my social handles are Amy W. Higgins. Easy peasy. Easy peasy. Um, Twitter's always the best. LinkedIn is linkedin.com backslash Amy W. Higgins. Yeah. It's great. I had a friend who came up to me when I worked at Google that asked for Amy Wiggins. As <laughs> 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 the only new on social. That's kind of cute. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Matt, if you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Amy. It's been a pleasure, and I've really enjoyed chatting with you. I want to let everybody know that this will be on YouTube shortly. It'll also be on Spreaker, and you can leave comments on the blog post at mindfulsocialmarketing.com. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, and have a Thanks, guys.